there were moments where I felt genuine connection. I felt almost as if I was talking to him, which is interesting cognitively. But I also felt a huge renewed sense of absence and loss. If AI starts to have a set of sensory mechanisms we don't have, maybe more sophisticated smell, maybe temperature sensing, maybe through IoT, it starts to do the same thing. Hello and welcome back to the brand new series of the Teens in AI podcast. My name is Adya and I'm your new host for this podcast. I'm joined by Michaela, my incredible co-host in today's exciting episode, where we're talking to Robbie Stamp, CEO of BIOS International, Chairman of H2G2.com, TEDx speaker, and member of the BSI Standing Committee on AI. Topics we discuss today include Robbie's views on digital reincarnation, the implications of the development of AGI, and his friendship with the famous writer Douglas Adams. We hope you enjoy today's episode and look out for further content behind the scenes, advice for teens interested in AI and announcements about future episodes on our social media, Twitter and Instagram at Teens in AI Pod. So hi Robbie, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. We're really excited to have you here. Well, I'm thrilled, absolutely thrilled to be here. Just to start off really quickly, you know, you mentioned Douglas Adam and your relationship with him and A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And for those of us, for those of um, our audience listening who may not be aware of your relationship with him and, you know, how involved you were in that whole, um, that whole side of things, can you elaborate a bit more and talk about that? Yeah, I was really lucky when I was when I was a producer at TV in TV. So back when would this have been? This would have been in the the early 90s. I met Douglas and we're very lucky. I mean, he went on to be a genuinely close friend. Um, I spoke to him the night before he died, uh, that my father had died that day. And I spoke to Douglas. So I had a pretty tough 48 hour patch. Uh, and uh, Douglas, Douglas was a remarkable man, became a very close friend. And from that very first meeting, when we discussed uh, the music of Bach, he was a great Beatles fan. Um, he also loved a book called The Glass Bead Game by Hermann Hesse, which was a book that my generation read and read and read, which actually has got some fascinating implications for AI. And we became very good friends. And we, Douglas was an enormously great companion. He was endlessly curious about things. Um, he liked his red wine, he liked his martinis and his champagne, and we could just, I can talk for England too, and, and you know, Douglas could too. So we would just spend, you know, hours happily talking about ideas and curious, and he was one of the most genuinely curious people I've ever met. Uh, and genuinely, I think one of the people I've met touched with genius. And I was immensely, immensely privileged to have known him professionally and as a friend. And I miss him to this day. I mean, it's, it's 20 years pretty much since he died. And and there's barely a day goes by where I don't think about Douglas or think about That's the lovely. ideas. And and can I, I know you brought about. some, I know you reflect a lot on some of the words that he said over the years. And I was just wondering um, what one of your favorite quotes from him that he has, you know, that he said perhaps just to you in casual conversation or in general that you know, you still think about to this day? Well, I suppose the one I find myself at the moment talking about most often in relation to AI, particularly, and indeed thinking about the future of humanity, is, is Douglas, and this isn't in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books, Douglas used to talk about a puddle, and he told this story of a puddle that wakes up one morning, and it looks around at the hole that it's in, and it thinks to itself, this hole fits me very neatly. In fact, this hole that I'm in fits me so neatly, it must have been made especially for me. And the con puddle continues to believe that the hole that it's in was made specially for it as the sun comes up and the puddle evaporates. And I think it's a genius, genius, simple way of, I think Doug one of the key things in Douglas's work, all of Douglas's work was a fascination with perspective, other perspectives, other points of view. But also I have always taken that puddle parable to be his plea for a bit more humility on behalf of Homo sapiens in believing that we're the apogee of cognition, perception and intelligence, as opposed to one unbelievably special expression of it. And I think 
for me, it almost sits at the heart of a world of worldview of philosophy that I've been thinking about and developing and noodling over the years, which is how do we both hold what is special and wonderful and constructive and creative about sapiens, understanding what is destructive as well. So what makes us special, what makes us unique, but at the same time, get over ourselves because how do we how do we recognize that we 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 subsist in a much wider range of networks a much wider range of you know all the fascinating new science about the way trees and fungal networks connect all the things which we exist in are so beautiful and so wonderful so if we can with a little bit more humility recognize where sapien sits in the great big scheme of things the creativity we could unlock with that create with with that i think would go well a very long way towards solving some of the problems that you, you know your generation is going to face my generation faces some of the legacy that my generation is bequeathing you but i think that simple genius of that paddle parable is as good an example as i can think of of why i love douglas and why i loved him as a friend and why i think he was touched with genius Perfect. And Douglas Adams' impact was immense through Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and throughout his life. H2G2 is still active and running. So do you have any plans for it? And what can we expect for the future of a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? So the answer is yes, big plans. Um, I mean, it's a long story, but I'll try and keep it short. I mean, we launched H2G2.com pre-Facebook, <laughs> pre Twitter, pre, you know, all those things. We were, we were more or less the same time as Google was coming out. We're pre Wikipedia. We are in many ways this forgotten little site on a forgotten part of a forgotten planet in a forgotten solar system. But there's something very special about H2G2. Um, and it's held together at the moment through love and sticking plaster. Good. It's a bit like one of those houses where maybe you're upstairs having a shower and somebody flushes the loo downstairs and suddenly you get scalded with hot water or frozen with cold water and nobody can quite work out how. But there's something about the, the joy, the fun, the unconventional, the radical, the willingness to be funny about things that sits at the heart of H2G2. And we, we launched live on a science program called Tomorrow's World back in 1998, live on television. And believe it or not, it was in the dial up world. Now, that probably doesn't mean anything, but this was in a world where when you connected to the Internet, it kind of went <laughs> noises through a modem. And it was it was not the broadband world we have now. One of the most exciting moments in my working life was sitting in my office back in these lovely offices. We had these cool, small offices in Covent Garden watching field researchers because the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy talks about field researchers just joining live in real time, thousands of them. And it was an amazing experience. And we, we, we were really on the way to somewhere. And then the Internet was a crash in Internet stocks in 2000. And we were a real victim of that. And I managed to, you know, with friends and things in the end, get the rights back from the BBC. And it was a devastating experience in my life at the time. I mean, we had worked so hard with a brilliant team of young people. We had people in their late teens. We had a, because of Douglas, we'd attracted an incredibly creative bunch of people. When you have that kind of a business setback, I went from chairing meetings with tables long enough to have a different weather system with bankers and lawyers to dealing with bailiffs in the office. It was really tough. So you hear a lot about technology and startups and the glory stories. You know, there are the people who don't make it and it's really, really difficult. And I remember when I set off to do H2G2, I read a book about a CEO who was in the office space, packing up the last person literally to leave, packing up the books and, you know, the bits and bobs. And I had exactly that same experience at the end of H2G2 after we'd sold it to the BBC, the last person sort of looking around all the offices. But we've managed somehow, it's still going. And had we been successful then, I don't think we would have avoided the business models, the toxic data relationships, which that generation of social media have all been sucked into. So there's a really special opportunity for us to reinvent it now, having looked at all of the businesses that have come and gone and say, okay, how do we because we don't have those toxic legacies. 
I have a, a, a site and a community that I feel an immense duty of care to. So whatever we do next, we'll honour and respect everything that they've done and kept going. But we have an opportunity here to reinvent the way we relate to people in terms of their own data, in terms of what a social media platform, which looks at collective problem solving and collective intelligence with wisdom, with fun, with unconventionality, which looks at a much wider range of voices. So all of those issues we're dealing with in AI at the moment, you know, goodness, look at the, the mess Google has got itself into recently with, you know, the sacking of one of, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the leading women in this world. And so they're all stuck in these toxic models. We can we can think differently. So that means sources of capital. How do you create sources of capital where you don't get bent out of shape? Because sources of capital really mean what the people who give you mean, mean a lot, what the people who give you money respect expect in return. And that whole venture capital escalator. Well, we're planning to do what I hope would be one of the biggest crowdfundings ever, where people can invest in increments of 42. And anybody who knows their Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is 42. You are hearing this pretty much for the first. This is kind of exclusive. Nobody's really, I haven't spoken publicly about this stuff and these plans that we're making. And we would like it if you were to invest 42p. If you're a guilty Silicon Valley billionaire wanting to try and do things differently, we'll take your 4.2 million. Thank you very much. But you won't necessarily get any more rights than anybody else. So we want to think about the way we create and exchange value. We want to have a much wider range of voices. And one of the things that I think when I think about governance, for example, is you, you consistently ask when you create something, how's that working for us? And that, so that allows you to think about, well, how do you, what do you mean by working and what is that? What's that thing you're trying to do? The next critical question is, who do we mean by us in this local context? And I think I won't write it, but there's a very good book to be written called The Narrow Us. All those voices, all those people who've been excluded from the tech, whose voices aren't listened to. We, how do we make that more inclusive? And then critically, my last question is, who are you asking how that's working. Who are you asking those first two questions of? Because so often you'll ask senior management, that's oh, going great. Well, of course it is, because you're getting the bonus, you're making lots of money, your share options are vesting. So I think I want to have a tilt at with H2G2, and I've registered the new domain, which it's going to be a part of, which is 42.0.com. So people talk about industry 6.0. I wanted another number. And it, 42 is one of the most famous memes, the answer to life, the universe and everything. And so I thought we'll have 42.0.com. And I want it to be revolutionary. And I can think of a no better group to work on thinking about what we could do with it than teens and AI. So that's a, an invitation and, I, and a hope that come next that year, we can do I some working and planning on it together. I absolutely love that idea that H2G2 existed right at the beginning where everything was just exciting before we had all of these toxic business models and the business model of grabbing people's data and it existed then, then it didn't exist and now it's going to exist once again and hopefully reimagine all of those amazing ideas and aspirations that we you guys had at that time and can actually become this source and this platform of excitement and a new way of thinking about what it means to interact over the internet and social media platforms. I think that's incredibly exciting. And new forms of ownership as well, because we can share value. We can make people members. We can, we can, we can not just have a system which siphons off money to diff distant shareholders. The value that's created in the system is value that we're going to look to share in the system. Uh, and 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 so there's brilliant people all over the world thinking such revolutionary thoughts about new currency exchange, new data models. There's a group called Holochain which looks at new kind of servers. Uh, yeah, it's it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Yeah. It's amazing because so many of our issues arise from the fact that we're in this toxic cycle of advertisement and data and that's how you monetize the internet. And so to really reimagine that is completely revolutionary and such an exciting thing to have, especially with, you know, Douglas Adams and his legacy. Yeah. I think that would be the ultimate thing. It um, would. And so 
Um, I want to kind of shift our focus a bit more to use some of these ideas that you have explored through your TED talk about this idea mm -hmm. of a digital afterlife. And I really want to use that as a framework to explore some of the fundamental questions that I think we will find ourselves asking each other about what does it mean to be human in the world of AI? What does it mean to have a life? What does it mean to have a consciousness? What is the future of artificial general intelligence? And so I want to use this idea of a digital afterlife as a framework to really explore some of those questions. And so just to give um, some of our listeners a bit of context into that, um, in, your in your TED talk, A Digital Afterlife, you mentioned the experience you had on the, I think it was the BBC Radio 4 programme, Unforgettable. Um, and so for our listeners, can you explain what that experience was and I guess the effect that it had on you? Really interesting you picked up on that because it was a pivotal moment for me, an absolutely pivotal moment for a lot of reasons. The, the basic idea for the program was, I think they were going to do, the idea was that somebody, a, a producer, had put together archive, audio archive material with several famous people. And the idea was that somebody was going to be in conversation with the archive as if they were talking to them in real time, actually having a conversation like we're having now. So this producer comes to my home and, and he's got many, many, many hours of Douglas Adams. And we talked a little bit about the, the path that I thought we might navigate. So the first thing I wanted to say is I don't really want to do the actually interesting, the creation of Hitchhikers, because I didn't know Douglas at that stage. I came to know him later. So I didn't feel that I had a legitimacy to talk about that. But what I did feel I wanted to talk about was his fascination with perspective. And I think it's one of that, so back to the puddle parable. So we, we plotted a path and we, we, we did the experience and there were a number of things that were fascinating about it. So the first thing was, you know, I put the, the earphones on my, on my head and I suddenly had Douglas in my head. Um, and that, uh, hearing these questions, listening to Douglas's voice, and that was just powerful in its own right. Now, at the end of the whole recording, the producer asked me, what did I think? What did I feel? And I said, well, it was really strange. I have two top level reactions. One is there were moments where I felt genuine connection. I felt almost as if I was talking to him, which is interesting cognitively. But I also felt a huge renewed sense of absence and loss because he wasn't there to hug. Douglas was a very huggy man. He was big, he was six foot five, he liked hugs. He was very generous, he was gregarious. He, as I say, was great company. And it made the sense of his loss and, and the absence of him even keener. And those two thoughts of a moment of bodily felt connection and renewed sense of absence of loss sort of triggered a whole set of thoughts in me about where the technology might lead us in terms of potentially millions of digital ancestors around us um, in various different forms. And of course, what's one of the oldest forms of worship we know on this planet is ancestor worship. The hearing of voices, listening to voices, you know, that's a, so they're very ancient experiences I put on the headphones with modern technology, something very primitive opening up all sorts of possibilities. And when I was doing the research, there was a famous story going around about a woman who had been part of a hacking computer collective. And one of the lead guys, one of her friends, was killed in a car crash. And what she did was she took all of the text messages that he'd ever sent her and ran it through an AI and created a sort of form of a grief bot. So she would come home at the end of the day and she'd say this guy's name is Andre and she would type and she'd say, Andre, how's your day? And he would go just chilling toots. Maybe it was her nickname for her. Um, and she would say, and he would say, well, how's your day been? And she would, and I saw the logs of those conversations. And what was fascinating about it was you could see there was a real yearning in her for this to be able to do more. And yet it was doing something. And I thought, wow, when if you add in where we'll get to with AI, where we'll get to with video technology, which can recreate our faces, where and what's the most profound thing about humans is that we die and that in that space of our lives, so much of our religions and everything are to do with, with that. 
what happens if there are forms of digital persistence? Now, I'm not advocating it, by the way. I'm not saying it's either I think it's a great idea or a terrible idea, though I do think a lot about grief. I did another TEDx talk about grief and bereavement and loss. And my position on grief is that you always start from where the person is. You might not believe it. I, I, I know I'm a bit elliptical, but one of the questions I was asked in another interview was tell the audience something that they'd be surprised to hear. So I said, you'd be surprised to hear that I can still have a bad hair day. Now, that, that would be so looking at me now, you might think, what? But I've been having a few bad hair days. So I went to have my hair cut this morning. And I, I've known these guys for 20, 25 years. And one of them's father had died recently in his 90s. And we were talking about the fact that when people deal with that kind of thing, very often, one of the first questions you should never, ever ask anybody about when, the, if their mum or dad died is how old they were, as if you're going to start to calibrate your sympathy. It's kind of, oh, mate, what if they were 90? I mean, you know, that's what happens. If somebody is sad, deeply, deeply sad and racked, if their, their dad was 101, that's where you start with your empathy and your compassion. You start when you support people through those times, through all sorts, with where they are. So don't ever lead with how old they were. Oh, well, that's all right then. Don't say to somebody they had a good innings. They can say that, you can't. Now that leads us back to your question, Michaela, about digital afterlives. If it helps some people, who would I or anybody else to say, horrible, no, don't do it, unethical, wrong. If actually some people, as is there is evidence, find that way of having some form of communication to get them through, who would be, who would we be to say don't? So that thought about digital immortality raises so many profound questions about human embodiments and things. That's incredibly fascinating. I think some of the emotions of connection and profound sense of loss is something that everyone does feel when someone close to them does pass away. In terms of AI and its representation of um, Douglas Adams, do you think AI has the potential to capture the true essence of a loved one? And is it the same as meeting them? Well, that's really another great question. I, I think that just just to be clear, that thing I did didn't have any AI, any, any AI in it. It was just an analog record or oh, it's a digital recording, but in that sense, analog technology. And this really gets to the heart of, I think, something that fascinates me, which is to start to think about the relationship between our embodied selves, our physical bodies. So here's the three of us. We're sitting in space, we're sitting, we can feel our feet on the floor, we maybe feel a bit of a... Um, and we're broadly sure that we're sharing a reality. And I'm not somebody who thinks that this isn't real. It's a reality. There are men plenty of other realities, back to puddles and perspectives. But it's real. Our embodied self, you know, our tummies, where we get nervous, where we get anxious, if we get moved, the tear in our eye, the where do you hold your tension, the, you know, what it feels like waiting for exam results, all of those deep embodied things. Then there is our, I call it our dream time self. So that's the self, the, the stranger things that happen in our dreams, the stranger moments, the funny little coincidences maybe, which just surprise you that something has happened. And then there is this fascinating inquiry into the nature of our data selves. So the, the, the nature of Michaelaness and Adjaness that is already out there in data space. And the thing about it is it is not a digital twin of, of, of any of us. It's something new, which is held in ones and zeros at the moment. That's, we'll, we'll get to quantum one day, but ones and zeros. And so that question about love, uh, at, at the moment, I, I'm, in, I'm thinking about it deeply because one of the things that I do as a thought experiment is to take a series of words and ask people to imagine whether an AI can be or do this thing or whether it's a word you can't use to safely describe what AI is and does, but then to understand the relationship. So can I use a, a little thought experiment by what I mean by that? Yeah, it's all right. So supposing either one of you comes home, we'll put it, I don't care how far in the future, it doesn't really matter, but we'll put it 10, 15 years. Supposing they come home, you come home and uh, you've had a hard day and there is a pretty decent Android sitting there. Um, and it says, Ajay, how was your day? 
and you go, oh. and he goes, what? So it was a bad day. You go, yeah. And he says, so what was it? He said, oh, I was in a meeting with that Robbie Stamp again. Honestly, every time I'm in a meeting with him, it's like, it's like fingernails down a blackboard. And he says, it says, Adja, go and get yourself a cup of tea or whatever and come back. Tell me about it. Now, you you start to feel empathised with your body starts to feel the hormonal reaction if somebody was being kind, thoughtful, a mum, a dad, a partner, a brother, a sister, whoever it might be. Now I'm going. Now the question that's interesting is: Are you being empathised with? Is it being empathetic? And does the distinction matter? Now I'm going to ratchet it up a little bit. At the moment, my working hypothesis, actually, yes, you are being empathised with. It isn't being empathetic. And yes, actually, the distinction does matter to inquire into. Um, so let's add another thing. You've also been wearing some kind of a tracking device, Michaela. So you've been wearing a, some kind of next generation Fitbit, which has tracked various hormonal chemical reactions in your body through the day. So it's tracked estrogen levels, testosterone levels, serotonin levels, cortisol. It's actually, and maybe this has been something you've had pretty much since birth. So it now knows that, for example, if you're under pressure, you do something with your hair, because I'm fixated with it. You do something with your hair, or you do, you do something with your eyes, or maybe you do something with your glasses. So my family knows me. They'll go, father's doing this, it's rubby eye. That's kind of father is feeling the pressure a bit. So it knows all that about you. It's an AI that reads your voice. We carry a huge amount of data in our voice. Now we're getting to something really interesting. Because if I was to ask either of you right now, give me a rundown on cortisol, estrogen, testosterone levels in your body, but you couldn't do it. But this thing can. So now this thing knows you in a way you don't even know yourself. So now its basis for being empathetic is really interesting because it's starting to be authentic in its own ontology, its own domain. And that's why these thought experiments are so incredibly valuable, because they allow you to really start to think about the nature of the relationship between human embodiment, human self and embodiment, and these other ontologies, these things. What's the essence of these things? What are they? What do they do? What are they and what aren't they? Um, and and I, I, I find it fascinating. So the digital immortality love piece, um, yeah, it's a biggie. And people will fall in love with AIs. It's it's the staple of science fiction, but it is going to happen. It will it will happen. And I have to ask about you know the second part of your thought experiment. There is very interesting about um, these these sort of hormone levels and an AI being able to have this I guess this own its own realm of being able to empathise with these with this new stuff. You know that is you know those hormones are actually what forms the fundamental basis for humans to empathise, even if we're not conscious of it. And so in your mind, does that still create a new ontology and a new way that AI has its own domain of being empathetic, or is that still you know is that still just actually AI? picking up on patterns whether or not humans consciously or subconsciously respond to those sort of stimuli if you see what I'm saying no absolutely I do and, and I think this is why I'm so fascinated by this and I and the answer is at the moment I don't really know but I'm thinking about it so I think that if you if, if, if the it's why I keep coming back to these this inquiry into the the essence of something so at this is at the moment my hypothesis is you are being empathized with but it's not being empathetic because if you had a friend who was in trouble or somebody was in trouble and they were really upset you might feel it in your tummy too you know if you really cared about them you, you would know that as a sort of you know a human animal to a human animal all of those reactions all of those things we feel in our tummy those anger joy upset you know frustration happiness all of the excitement, depression, all of those things, we know that our other fellow creatures are feeling those things too. So in that sense, what we've always took to be and mean by empathy. But I was having a very interesting conversation with a friend who's on the autistic spectrum. And he was saying, well, look, I don't really feel empathy, but I know it's expected of me. So I've taught myself to start to pick up the cues to understand that empathy is expected of me. So I now I've so does that mean that I actually don't feel empathy because it isn't in that sense authentic? And that opens up that fascinating conversation and thought about AI because 
what we do, you and I, the three of us right now, we're gathering data all the time with our brains. Our brains, and, and a lot of the data that we're gathering is being discarded because we don't need it right now. Um, but we have our sensory mechanisms. So we have our ears and our sight and our smell and our touch and maybe some other special ones we don't know about. And we gather that data through a 3.2 billion years of chemical substrate evolution of us on this planet. We process it and we enact in the world. We then do things. I'm upset, I'll cry. I'm upset, I'll get myself a glass of wine. Um, if AI starts to have a set of sensory mechanisms we don't have, maybe more sophisticated smell, maybe temperature sensing, maybe through IoT, it starts to do the same things. It starts to gather through its sensory mechanisms, wider range of perception back to the puddle than we currently do. And then you really do get interestingly into the realms of is empathy a word you could use to describe AI? So I, I kind of have a running experiment that I do. I have three categories of word. One is I think this is a word you can use to describe what AI is or does. Then there's a category like the one we've just been discussing, empathy, where you go, mm -hmm, I'm not sure. And then there's a category of words which I really think you shouldn't, like accountable, for example. I don't believe that AI can in any way, shape or form be accountable. So let's not make those mistakes. But for example, could it exert authority over me? Yeah, absolutely. So in the A-level <laughs> this thing you've just all been through. I would argue that in the moment your generation got those letters uh, through the post, that at that moment, AI was wielding significant authority over you. Whether or not it had been set in motion by the, uh, by the DFE, what it didn't do was send results to your head teachers and your heads of department and teachers and go, I'm about to give Adia an ABE. And they go, what? She's never got any in her life. That's that's nuts. So you 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 got the letter. So there wasn't a human in the loop at a critical moment. And at that moment, all the conversations, some data scientist, forgive me, I know you're about to go and data scientist, but coming and saying, oh, no, you don't understand about AI. It's only maths and probabilities and it's not this and it's not. That. Don't anthropomorphize that. At that moment where this teen, this late teen is getting their A-level results, getting her A-level results, the last thing they care about is some data science popping up and going, oh, this thing's just maths. I have, she had a relationship with this ontology at that moment and an actually extraordinarily powerful one, which may be affected life chances. So that's why this way of thinking about things, these word thought experiments for all of us, is actually just, because in a way it's very simple to do. You can pick any word and go, hmm, I don't know, which of those three categories does it go in? Yeah, and I'm um, going back to this idea of a digital afterlife, picking up on something you said there about, you know, the fact that humans have a tendency to, um, again, this idea of perspective, to see themselves as the centre of the universe and indeed to therefore kind of anthropomorphise everything that happens around them and make it, you know, something that they understand and related to the human condition and things like that. And so I'm interested in what you view as some of the risks of this idea of digital reincarnation, digital, um, you know, digital afterlife. And and this really, uh, this idea of AI becoming, you know, humans having a psychological reaction and projecting their ideas of humanity and the human condition onto an AI. What are some of the risks that you can see this creating? Many. And as I say, I want to be clear, I'm not necessarily advocating this. I'm just saying I'm yeah. pretty certain it's going to, it's already happening. Yeah. And there are already people who have found comfort, even in the early stages of it. You can be sure that there will be a sufficient number of people. So that's not to answer the risk question, but it is just to be clear. I'm not saying I think it's great or I think it's it's a disaster. And actually, just to jump in, sorry, before you answer, mm. we actually recently talked to uh, David Hansen on the podcast and he was, you know, he was saying exactly like you were saying, he was saying that he believes he has the technology to create um, AGI within the next five to 10 to 15 years. And so uh, this, that is why I'm posing this question to you, because I think it's something so important that we discuss now. OK, well. There are two quite things that I'd like to like to talk about there. One is AGI, if you'll let me come back to it, because I have increasingly come to think that the way in which AGI and the singularity is phrased is a deeply colonialized white male fantasy. But I'll come back to that. <laughs> um, the, 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 the question about the risks. Um, 
I think that that what are the risks? There are privacy and data risks. So there's a fascinating thing about who owns your data when you're no longer here in an embodied chemical self. Who owns that? Who who has access? Is it something you bequeath yourself to to who? To your your ancestors? To a to a trust? What do you do with all that data? We already know all of those data ghosts out there. I mean, there's upsetting things when, you know, I had a somebody who used to work for me at the Digital Village with Douglas and one of the most genius programmers that we worked with, and he died very sadly some years ago. And for ages, it would be, oh, you know, his name would come up. And we, you know, so we've already got this idea of, you know, digital presence it, it persisting after we've died. It's already here. So those issues around ownership and privacy, I think it's going to get really strange is the answer, because I think that that, that, and that it's not a very good one. But the answer is it's going to be strange. And goodness, for your generation, I think you're going to enter the strangest century that any sapien century has, has, has ever entered. Because I think the speed at which so many of the boundaries between our embodied selves, our dreamtime selves and our digital selves are going to start blurring not just at the moment, but in time terms as well, in temporal terms. So if we really push the thought experiment and think, you know, there would be a time where video technology, video, we already know about deep fakes. They're already here. Good enough for actually my voice, a video to say, I, you know, I wonder what Grandpa Robbie would have to say about that and go and have a conversation with him. And if the AI is sophisticated enough, it, it, it will be there and it will be, all I can say is it will be an experience. It won't, of course, be the same experience as being able to hug a grandpa. Of course, we can't hug grandpas at the moment, but, you know, hug a grandpa, just to say that quickly, <laughs> hug a grandpa or a grandma. I know right now as we're recording this, we're all being told not to go and do that at Christmas. Um, and it, 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 it's, it's fascinating. So it will be an experience and we don't know what the full psychological effects are going to be. But but and there will probably be an entire psychological, psychological therapeutic space will open up to deal with and be these relations. What does it mean to have these relationships? What does it mean? You know, if any of us have ever experienced the pain of unrequited love and probably well, I've, you have or you haven't yet, but maybe you will do one day. I've certainly have in my life one of the most painful experiences you can have. Will there be equivalence where you feel, I love this AI, but they don't quite get me. They can't return everything I want. They can't return my infection. Oh my God, I'm in this kind of space where I'm, where I'm, I'm I, it's going to get strange is all I can say. Um, and, you know, we, that's what's, that's what's going to happen. It will, it's going to get very strange. And I think in that sense, as strange as any century Sapiens has ever lived through. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, unrequited love with AI. I wonder what the future is going to bring. So in terms of developing the technology to uh, meet our ancestors and meet other people who aren't around us at this point in time. So what's the kind of the main reasons for developing this technology? Is it scientific curiosity or is it something else? And what are the pros or cons and which one which outweighs the other? specifically this digital immortality or kind of AI in general? Um, I guess both. I, I suppose maybe start off with digital immortality and then go on to AI. Well, I suppose, you know, the pros are, are, are in a way that we've been talking about, which is that I suspect that for many people, it will be a source of comfort. It will be a way of being able to have a conversation, talk, commune, be reminded. Yeah, of course, you know, we, we already, you can listen to videos, you can watch videos of and so on, and that, that brings some form of solace. But if it actually comes with a, I've had a bad day today, Grandpa, and Grandpa voice going, Sweetheart, tell me about it. What 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 what's been so bad about it? Well, it was it was it was a rubbish day. You know, for whatever the reasons, it was a rubbish day. And it says, you know, and then it says, oh, you do you remember when you were small? Do you remember what I used to say? I used to tell you, you know, I used to tell you that story about um, whatever it might be, whatever kind of grandpa, you know, classic kind of grandpa kind of advice, which was, look, uh, you know, you 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 can't control everything, so try and control the things you can, influence the things you can, and just don't worry about the rest. Just don't worry about it because you can't do anything about it. So don't expend that energy that I can 
feel you're expending now. And of course, if it starts to use those kind of language, I can feel that. You will, I guarantee, as, a, as an embodied human being, you will start to feel back to our empathy thought experiment. So I can see it being like anything. There's always this tension between things that are deeply constructive and destructive, and they will always be there. There's no utopian answer. And indeed, in a, in a way, anything which sets out to create utopia almost always ends up in dystopia. There's a, there's a quote from the philosopher Immanuel Kant, who talks about from the crooked timber of humanity, no true thing was ever made. And that's that understanding of what messy, complex, contradictory creatures we each, every one of us are at your age, at my age, we're capable of kindness, we're capable of thoughtlessness, we're capable of joy, we're capable of thinking. I do, you know, frequently I thought, oh, Robbie, that wasn't very kind. Why did you say it like that? You didn't get that right. We, we do that all the time. We're just these contradictory, wonderful, messy creatures. And therefore, the, the future will be full of messy contradictions. It'll be full of magic and it'll be full of difficult things, too. And that's just the reality. And what you want to kind of do in your own life is, can I be somebody, whatever space it is, that just nudges the dial towards it being constructive rather than destructive? It's so interesting all the stuff you're talking about because we know so little about humanity, both in the scientific and biological sense and in, you know, what we're capable of and what it means to be human. And yet here we are developing technology that can replicate it or indeed, you know, almost stand in as it. And so, you know, it's a very scary idea. And um, I want to go back to one thing you said um, that I think we forgot to elaborate on. And that was your, uh, yeah, your statement that AGI, you do believe, is um, a sort of white male Slightly provocatively, a white male deeply colonialised fantasy. So yes. why do I think that? I think it because I think that the way at the moment, and I'll use the, the, the epistemological base. So what I mean by epistemology is just what does it mean to know and be known? And I, I, I know my daughter will forgive me, but I'm going to tell a quick little story. There's a on my whiteboard here in the office. My, my daughter's now 26. We've had a long standing joke for a long, long time since she was a teenager about various jokes about calling each other stupid, smelly and ugly. Um, and so on my board right now, which I've left for 15 years, there's a stick figure of me with an arrow pointing to it going stupid, ugly father and a thing saying beautiful daughter. To this day, she's 26. I will get an emoji or a joke, which I know is you know making a joke on that. The other thing that I joked about when she was growing up was that I was reading a book which was uh, for fathers about building self-esteem in your teenage daughters. So if I made a joke when she was 15 about being smelly and she'd go, hang on a second, father, just just which, which bits in the book that you're reading about self-esteem in your teenage daughters? Is it all right to call your 15 year old daughter? So just are you are you sure you're reading the book right? So it's, a, it, it, it's both a fun story, but what's so interesting, I've just told you that story, both of you. Obviously, you're, you know, recently you've been the age she was. You'll be parsing it. You'll be thinking about it. We've just laid down, had, had our brains been wired up at that moment, modern science would have shown some amazing patterns of electrical activity going on in our brains, maybe memories being laid down, responses. And we would have known that something was going on. And it may have been we would have known that a memory was being laid down. A part of your brain lights up magic. But I believe that AGI will never get at what has just happened between the three of us as three embodied human beings, you know, an older guy, two teenagers thinking about these these things, a personal story, a fun story, an interesting story intellectually. What that means for each of us as you then reach back into your own backgrounds, your own relationships with filaments which go back, which has made each one of us completely unique. And I think this engineering fantasy that there is an epistemological mother load out there which gets at one day we go, ta-da, we know everything. This AGI knows everything we know. It can never know what that moment just meant to the three of us, ever. And now you add in all the forms of thinking about knowledge and epistemology, which they completely ignore about what it means to be human. So all the, all the embodiment piece that we've been talking about you know, the tears, all the things that make us human and indeed therefore make our intelligence. So 
and if you look at the colonialized piece, there are I, I'm deeply interested in indigenous indigenous knowledge and wisdom and perception. There's groups of people who've never lost sight of Douglas's puddle, who've never lost sight of what it means to be human in a wider range of epistemologies. So you know, one of the one of the, the 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 groups talk about when they meet to make policy, they ask who speaks for Wolf, and what that means is who's not in the room at the moment, who are our other responsibilities to as we exist in a world of mycelium networks, that amazing science that's going on at the moment about trees, the, 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 the all of those embodied, those embodiment, that embodied experience we have, that's all part of our intelligence. And this engineering fantasy that you can just strip all that other part of us out, that mind-body dualism, I just think is genuinely a nonsense. That's not to say that what's not going to emerge will be phenomenally powerful, that already does things that we don't do at speeds we will never get at. So it's not to be a Luddite and say that this stuff isn't happening around us. But the, 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 the paradox, back to this paradox, is to understand its ontology, what it is going to be, what its sensory mechanisms are, what our power relationships with it, who wields it, who wields that power, who wields that agency over it. Does it ever have its own forms of agency? Absolutely think about those things. But to suggest that it will ever get to the space where it is like us in that super sense, I just think is literally an epistemological nonsense. And I think it excludes vast swathes of thinking, which it hasn't even considered in its framework. It's not, doesn't, it's never sat down with somebody from the Lakota Nation to ask. I've got a brilliant paper written by a woman from the Lakota Nation who talks about when the Lakota Nation create a sweat lodge, one of the most important elements in their society and their anthropology and their epistemologies all the things that she's taken that and used it to think about the life cycle of an AI system. None of that thinking takes those other ways of embodiment. So I'm quite passionate about this because I think that that, that there's a lot of, well, I, I think, and I think some of it's dangerous. And as, as I said, I think it's exclusionary. I think it's lazy because I think a lot of the thinking, a lot of the worldviews, it just hasn't bothered to take in. I think that that's a loss of food for thought. Now, some things you've mentioned, you've talked about how AI and humans are fundamentally different. Now, what are the main differentiators between AGI and humans? And do you think that if AGI is developed, that it's sort of going to be the same as itself? So say there's more than one piece of AGI that has been developed, that each instance of AGI is the same. How, how does it differentiate from humans? Well, that's a brilliant phrase, actually. The same, the, the, that phrase, the same as itself. That's really, that's really, really interesting. Because in a way, in my classically long-winded way, that's what I'm trying to say, that the real inquiry is exactly that. What we need to understand is what is that sameness of itself and what our relationship with it is going to be. Because it is already going to be powerful and we already see, you know, algorithms out there in data space and data warfare and that the horror show that is out there in data space about fake news and all those things, which we probably don't have time for today. So it's already there. It's, it's everywhere. I think I come back to the theme that's been running through a lot of what we've said today is, is to think, you know, if, if it cannot be unrequitedly in love itself, for example, um, if it doesn't feel pain as well as joy, then it can never be like us. It's it's different from us. It's just different. We are a 3.2 billion year chemically substrate evolved thing, ontology. It is a silicon evolved something else, which does some things which will overlap with us and some things which it does already at speeds and maths and things which we'll never get at. And, it, that, and likewise, there are things which we will, I, I believe, do forever, which it doesn't do. It doesn't feel. And, it, and therefore, the really interesting question is to investigate what it makes us think about what it means to be human, and what it means for us to think about how we relate to each other, how we relate to each other uh, more, uh, more, more inclusively um, and how we relate to it. So I think that your, your, your question is, is a fabulous one. And that phrase, the same as itself 
is actually the clue to what I what I'm thinking about. So I'm going to be borrowing that, I hope, because because it's a it's a brilliant it's a brilliant phrase because that's exactly what I keep on banging on about with thinking about these ontologies. We need to understand what itself is, what ourselves are, where the overlaps are, and then critically what the power relationships are. Who is going to wield this power long before it may be in some singularity taking over way wields it for itself? We can already see the effects of when algorithms, for example, trade our behavioral futures in social media, that power is being wielded over us by algorithms right now here today. So we already have a relationship. But thank you for that. That's that's um, that's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> that great praise. And um, stemming from your views on sort of the evils of human certainty, do you think mm. that AI should ever or will ever be given the power of conviction and belief? Oh, God, what great questions. Um, I'm loving it. So just quickly, that certainty question you've asked me also came from the conversation I had with Douglas in that unforgettable radio program. Because the moment of connection that I felt was I was sharing an idea with him based on three books that I'd read recently. I'm not going to go through what they were because it'll take up too much time. But they were all, for me, different reflections of the evils that men and women do when they're certain about things. And when they, I am certain that I am right and you are wrong. Um, and in that certainty, I start to commit all sorts of horrors. And indeed, a lot of the history of totalitarian 20th century totalitarianism is is about that when when I'm so certain that I'm right I make you the other and once I've made you the other I feel I can do whatever I like to you so I've been th that, that phrase the evils of certainty that's where I was noodling and in fact I talked with Douglas about that in the in the conversation and there was a great way he was able to come back and that and that was that strange embodied moment where I felt a connection so to think about the the, the the questions just remind me which two words you specifically asked me about um conviction and belief, conviction and belief. that's so interesting isn't it yeah. <laughs> i think that's incidentally why i've started to run some clubs where we do exactly this we come together and we pick some words <laughs> and uh, which I allocate and when each each of us thinks about this so conviction and belief could an AI said to be con convinced about what it's doing again in its own self that it, to you to use Adia's phrase about the safe it's same as itself in its own frame of reference the answer is yes it could be convinced that we shouldn't lend this person money it could be so it, it, it you know we're not going to make you a loan we're not going to bring you in for a job interview. Um, and But what worries me so deeply about its form of conviction is what we then do in relation to that conviction. So there are two branches that can go off. If it is in its own frame of reference, convinced I can lend Robbie X amount of money or no, I shouldn't. Does a human have the capacity to come back and go, no, 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 he's good for it. It's all right. Or you go, okay, if that's, that was the machine decision, I now will accept the machine decision or does the machine actually not even put it back through a human? It just says no. And in that case, in that sense, it's conviction. That's a strong word. It's conviction actually does exist. And I, so I, I think that, that that's a, a really interesting word to inquire into and belief. Would it believe something? And again, you could see within its same as its selfness, yeah, it could believe. So I, I was having this discussion with somebody the other day about facial recognition technology. It was an incredibly hot topic um, and about using facial recognition technology to screen candidates for interview. We know they're out there. So here was the discussion. Somebody was saying to me, you can't use a word like authority to describe AI. AI is something humans have. And I said, well, hang on. Supposing you've got a, an HR department, three people, and they is their job is to screen CVs and invite people for a job interview. They have a boss. Has the boss delegated authority to them to decide who is coming in for a job interview? Not yes, they have. Okay. So if a, if an AI is doing precisely the same work and is making exactly the same recommendation, this person comes for an interview. This person does it. Not only 
can you use the word delegated authority? You must use it because you must now be clear what the relationships that you've created are. So it's not just a you should, you need to because you need clarity about that relationship. So within your belief question, it will be interesting. You Could you say at that moment, the AI believes Robbie shouldn't come in for an interview, but Michaela should come for an interview. Would you use that word to describe it? Um, and, and, and that, so there's one thing about whether or not you use that word belief. And then the other thing is what's the effect of that? If the effect of it being able to make that decision is Michaela does come for an interview or she doesn't come for an interview, no human in the loop. That's a really big boundary to have crossed. And it's a boundary that I think lots of organisations are crossing without thinking about it. Now, of course, there are the good things about that. You know, you, the AI can be told to name the name because we know all the racism that sat there with CVs and names, people with the same qualifications. They get the wrong name. It's a it's a Middle Eastern sounding name, an African sounding name. We don't. You know. So you can be told to ignore that stuff. So I'm not saying it's all bad by any means. There are lots of things that it will do which will compensate for things that we don't, don't get right. Um, but to inquire like you're doing verbally into the nature of what it is or is not doing and then our relationship with it is actually the space that's why i'm having so much fun which i'm kind of wanting to, to to get more people to think about not at these abstracted areas of governance and ethics and the key principles because nobody's going to write the we want our ai to be biased and this are an absolute nutcase so that's the first thing you do with your yellow sticky the hard yards are in what happens when it's in your system that, those are the hard yards. What's happening with it when it's in your system? Oh. <laughs> so you've registered the domain homo, uh, homotechnesis.com. Can you talk about what homotechnesis means, why you've done that, and what you hope that space will provide for you? Yeah, yeah I'm a bit of a domain junkie. I, I like domains, particularly <laughs> if I can find .coms. So I, uh, I, I actually re recently registered one just in the light of what I was just saying about you know the work you do to start with as you're brainstorming someone which is first yellow sticky.com is is something so homotechniensis is my thought about the hybrid human that maybe emerges what happens at what stage are you purely chemically substrate evolved human because of course we've already had pacemakers we've had you know people with hearts various for heart you know things people that help their heart rhythm to if they have arrhythmia to be resettled various implantations there are already people who've got you know chips in them to open doors at what stage does sapiens stop being sapiens and become something different um now very arbitrarily not scientifically at all i've decided the percentage is 42 because of pictures are kind of at the stage at which you're kind of 42 percent augmented you're no longer sapiens you'll be techniensis um so it's it's that it's that mixture of augmentation, gene augmentation. And of course, the thing that worries me most about that is inequality. Who gets access to that? Who, who has the access to those augmentation technologies? Um, and of course, you know, so the capacity to, to have a, a form of sapiens, which has evolved into augmented sapiens and then sapiens. So I, I again, a thought experiment here. Imagine there's a very famous movie called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? in the 1960s about race relations and the uh, the whole idea is that there's a sort of a, a west coast family and uh daughter's boyfriend is coming to dinner for the first time uh, and he's a young black man and it was exploring tolerance race relations in the 60s so i imagine a new version which is same same setup somebody's coming it could be either way around it could be you know somebody's girlfriend is coming for the first time somebody's partner is coming for the first time and um, you, you, uh, they come and they're wearing glasses, a cool pair of designer glasses. And uh, after a little while, it's been a little bit awkward, a bit of a chit chat. Um, Mum and dad go out into the kitchen to get the vegan burgers right and say, well, what do you think? And, and maybe mum says, he couldn't even leave his glasses behind. And when you unpack that, what it means is he is sapiens and he is wearing his glasses as an unenhanced human being, as a badge of honour, like you, you'd wear any badge. She comes from a techniensis family and mum does not want her daughter, her son, breeding with a sapiens because they're, te they're a techniensis family. Um, I've said earlier how strange it's going to get. I'm not, believe me, I'm not advocating this. 
but it's going to happen because wealthy, powerful people, what do you do when you've got the yacht, you've got the drinks, you've got, you've got the drinks cabinet from, you know, the wine collection, you've got the homes, you've got, what do you do? You think about immortality. You think about enhancing yourself. You know, there are already so many people in, in wealthy communities around the world who are availing themselves of every single one of these technologies. Now, some of them will therefore be available to a wider range. But they won't be available to an awful lot of people in a time scale, which means it's all equal. So Homo techniensis is something that I've, I've done it as something that worries me a lot because I think the potential for inequality with it is absolutely huge. And again, it's another of those. I'm not advocating it, but let's be clear that given what we know about power and about what people like to do, it's going to happen. And, you know, it's so interesting. It's a whole other topic in itself that um, I know Ali and I could ask you questions about probably yeah, for definitely. seven hours. I'd love that. Um, my last question for you is that a very funny looking book behind you. And I want to know uh, what, what exactly is it? Ah, oh, what, what this one on the top of my pile here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, this is a book called Moomin Lad, Min, Moomin Land Midwinter by Tova Janssen. And uh, she's a brilliant, if you don't know her, or if you don't know the Moomin books, they are astonishing, weird, wild, full of philosophy. And I was first read these books when I was a child by my mother. Um, and there's another one actually called Comet in Moomin Land. And one of the most vivid of being read to experiences I had with the child was the sense of foreboding and dread, the way Toa Janssen described this comet arriving in Moomin Land and seas driving up. So I, one of the things I do is I've gone, as we think about some of these questions, which have been a big theme about human embodiment, is I'm going back to a lot of the books that made such a deep impact on me when I was a child and thinking about what that means as a human. And again, thinking about all the things that I think AGI will never get at, the role that the Moomins have played in my life. Um, and at the moment, um, I'm, I mentioned my mother works full time, but we've had this lovely thing where I read her a poem every day um, and we've been re-exploring some of these stories together. You know, some of the stories that she read me and that I now get a chance to read back because she has this incredibly high powered job and it's another place for us to be. So Moomin Books, Moomin Land is a, I, a, I love them and I've been wonderful rediscovering them. Uh, they're childhood books. They are full of philosophy and they really make me think about the nature of human embodiment. Wonderful. So that was incredibly fascinating. So we've got some brief quick fire questions to uh, get through. So the first one is, who are the two people who have inspired yourself most on your journey? Well, I would have to say Douglas. Um, I mean, if, if I'm not gonna do sort of family, um, I would have to say Douglas Adams uh, une 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 unequivocally. Um, uh, yeah, Douglas Adams. Um, I'm going to go, the next one I'm going to go is Charles Schultz, the author of Peanuts. Uh, the Charlie Brown, Linus, Lucy cartoons, because he is an absolute genius and his exploration of humanity and philosophy is I think as great as any literature. It's as great as Tolstoy, it's as great as Dickens. He is astonishing and he inspires me every day. My, my, I just had a, 20, uh, a, a big birthday and my son gave me the entire collected works, all 25 volumes, and I'm reading, reading them all the time. And he inspires me hugely to think about the nature of humans and human embodiment. So Douglas and Charles Schultz, those are two goodies. Exciting. So next question is, uh, will we ever have super intelligent or sentient AI or AGI? So uh, I think we will have, uh, yeah, we will have sentient AI to use your brilliant phrase, and it will be the same as itself. It will be its own kind of sentience. So it will have sentience. It will be sensing things. It will be processing data and it will enact in the world. So in that sense, to both of those questions, yes, but it's not going to be wholesale like us. That's my the big thing. So yes, we'll have it, but I suspect it's not going to be exactly the way that so many people or a lot of people currently conceive it. Right. What's the most exciting project you've worked on? I would say probably, if I'm really honest, I, I'm going to give two answers. 
One was directing Midsummer Night's Dream at university um, uh, as a theatre director, young theatre director, age 20. And I just loved it. It was one of the great experiences. And the other was creating Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the first, the, the, the Earth edition of H2G2 with the great Douglas Adams and with an astonishingly brilliant young team of people. That was, that was super exciting. I've had lots of other things, lots of other colleagues, please. But that really was very exciting. If you have to solve one problem with AI, what would it be? Inequality. Inequalities of all kinds. If I could, if, if I could it would be how do we bring more people to the fullness of their capability so they are in flow and able to make the contribution that is their most authentic contributive self. So I would use AI to try and do all the things that humans don't need to do. And I would try and use it to create the space for us to be as fully human as everybody on the planet can be. So inequality would be my one. Okay, so two last questions. Um, they both sort of link to each other. First is what scares you the most about the future of AI? Probably autonomous weapon systems. I think probably if I think probably autonomous weapon systems. I think that the, that we are on, and this is back to the constructive destructive thing, and in one's own lives, where one tries. To, I think I think it's autonomous weapon systems because I think that no, at the moment no state actor will think I cannot be in that race because if I'm not in that race, then the the, the, the people who I don't trust are. So you've got, and so that's I think probably autonomous AI in weapon systems. That's definitely one of the things that scares me the most too. Um, okay, just one final question. So in terms of the future of AI, what excites you the most? I think it's that phenomenal capacity that if we get it right, that it brings us a whole new perspective and power to remind ourselves of both what is special about ourselves and at the same time get over ourselves and and understand more about the beauty of the planet what it means to be good stewards so i'd like to finish with a with a with with a, with a thought which is that in the world at the moment it seems to me that the species is reacting to the complexity we face very broadly with two kinds of responses. One is the response, which is build a wall, metaphorical, literal, literal, blame other people, create enemies within and without, and hark back to a golden age, which by and large, a lot of people mean, wasn't it better when a load of white middle-aged men were in charge? And, and everything that that implies and set against that is what? Everybody who cares about it being different, we're all struggling to find that narrative that is powerful enough to counter that. So the narrative I'd offer is be a good ancestor. It's what does it mean in your own lives to think about, can I, whether it's sweeping outside my front door, being a great mum, dad, brother, sister, mentor, friend, reforming multilateral global institutions, creating a genius technology, what does it mean for me to genuinely think generations ahead and what can I do? So set against build a wall, be a good ancestor. And what's one of the other things I'm hoping to do is be involved in launching a movement, which is just simply hashtag be a good ancestor. That's so powerful. Robbie, thank you so, so much for coming and talking to us today. That was absolutely fascinating. And I know I'm going to go away and think long and hard about a lot of the things that you've talked about today. And I think our listeners will absolutely love it. You've given them so much food for thought. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Robbie, for coming to talk to us on this week's podcast episode. For everyone listening, please do share your thoughts and reflections on this week's episode on social media, across Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram, and tag us at Teens and AI Pod or at Teens and AI. We'd love to hear your thoughts, your comments and reflections. As always, please do keep in contact and stay tuned across our social media platforms and across Spotify, iTunes and YouTube for further updates and episodes. Thank you and goodbye for now.